What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over a fun episode for episode 150, and that is going to be frame data. So, frame data you may know from fighting games, and a lot of times what it will track is damage, stun frame, startup, active recovery, uh, advantages, disadvantages, this sort of thing. And I'll keep track of all your moves and, and actions and how they relate to actual numbers in the game. So if I were to attack my opponent here, they are stunned for a specific amount of frames. I've upped the numbers for this episode so we can really test it out. And so I have the stun on 45 frames when I do a light attack here. And of course we have our damage values and things like that. Now, great, that looks good, but it's really hard to visualize, right? So frame data can also be achieved and shown off in this method here, where we have these you know, actual stats here. Now ignore the startup active and recovery frames for now. We're gonna do them in the next frame data episode. Right now I'm gonna be going over the widget, how we can grab this data, where it should come from, how we can set it and assign it on here. But the damage and the stun frames actually work right now. So if I am to attack my opponent, you can see that that attack did 10 damage and put the character into a state where they were stunned for 45 frames. Now, same deal, if they block and I attack them, it changes the damage and the stun. So whatever they received last for their damage and stun is what updates the HUD here with the appropriate values. Now, right now it might not seem that important, or maybe it does, depends on how you're thinking of it, but it can be really useful for a lot of things that we're gonna do in the future not only for balancing and other mechanics that we may be implementing, but there's one really, really massive thing that's gonna be useful for, that is rollback netcode. So rollback netcode, that's a popular one. I figured we should start working on that type of mechanic. And to get this sort of thing implemented, we have to make sure everything is right. It is a very complicated mechanic, probably the most complicated we will cover in the entire series, but I have been working on it in the background. Now, it is genuinely far from ready, but I've been able to use a plugin, an open source plugin, and start working in Unreal. And there's a lot that we have to do to get it to work, but I have gotten some things to work and actually have some, some functioning functional pieces here. There's also a lot that I do not have and that I'm still working on. And for this, we could use some more data. So in the future, and you're probably gonna see a lot of things popping up here that are more related to uh, data, actual data, and retrieving values from things because rollback netcode works off of a state, you know, a bunch of states and educated guesses of what players are doing and sending that data and then fixing mistakes that were made to put the game in the proper state without any input delay. Anyway, we'll go into that a lot more when we get into those actual topics. We're not quite there yet, but I did want to start the process and I figured something that we're really missing is frame data. Even though it technically exists without us displaying it, like yes, we have damage and we have stun frames, we never had an actual method to display it without manually looking at the data table or the animation blueprint or just knowing the animation itself. So now we're gonna get this set up today where we can actually use it and visualize it and it's gonna pave the way for a lot more things down the line. So that's what we're gonna be working on today. And as you can see, this is also only gonna be available in the practice mode. I mean, you can make it available in any mode you want, but you probably don't wanna have this up for verses. So like our input stacks, we're gonna make this available just in practice mode or training mode, whatever you wanna call it. All right, guys, so we can go ahead and get started. But before we do, I want to give a huge shout out to my Patreon members and YouTube membership subscribers. Thank you guys so much for everything you've done. I really appreciate it. I'm really grateful that you have given me so much support and have been so excited to work on your games and see the tutorial come to life. It is so incredibly amazing, and I really appreciate everything you've done. So thank you guys so much. Also, on that note, this is episode 150 of the Fighting Game Tutorial Series, so we have done a ton of episodes, and we still have a ton to go. 
But if you want to get caught up, check out everything we've done and how you can implement that for yourself. I'll link this playlist right here in the top right corner. Alternatively, if you're just interested in frame data, that is perfectly fine as well. You can implement that without implementing the entire series, but I would recommend watching this episode right here, which is where we set up data tables for our moves, and that's going to be relevant because we're going to be pulling data that we have coming from those data tables and putting it into our widget. With all that out of the way, we can go ahead and get started. So to start off today's episode, I'm just going to go into my hitbox data data table. You don't actually have to change anything in here if you don't want. You may have already set all yours up, so you don't have to stress about this too much. The reason I'm going in here is so you can see all my values now. A lot of these values have changed. I've changed either the actual damage values or the stun frames, block stun frames, some of the pushback distances and stuff as well. So I've gone in and I've just changed a bunch and, and set them to values I felt were more appropriate. This is still far, far from final. This is just kind of random values that I put in, but I did change them so that they were different. That way you could see them updating on the, on the widget. So just in case you're curious about any of that, you can check that out and make sure you go ahead and do this and, and make everything what you want to see when you hit them on in the game and what you want to see on the widget but we don't have any specific values we have to do so we can close that when we're done with it and we want to make a new widget and we're going to put it on our HUD but of course we have to make it first so we're going to need our HUD open so feel free to open that guy up and then we're going to add a new widget so go wherever you want to I added it in my blueprints widgets HUD section because it's going to be going on the HUD and it, you just click add new user interface and widget blueprint here. Once you do, you name it. I called mine frame data panel because I was thinking of it like this, where we have two, one below each health bar for each player, right? Now you didn't really see it there because I was only attacking with player one, but player one and player two both had this frame data panel. So if you have AI that attacks back, or if you have two players playing in the practice mode, both of their panel should show up. So we're gonna make one panel and we can add as many as we want, but I think frame data panel is a good name because we can kind of add it on. It's not built into the HUD. We can add it and take it away as needed. So with that said, when you come into your frame data panel here, now it doesn't matter if you're doing this in UE4 or UE5, it's gonna be the same method. What I've done is I've just taken the default canvas panel that's here with UE4. If it's UE5, you will have to add a canvas panel if you wanna copy this directly, but it's really no big deal. You can just search canvas panel and drag it in. Now, I haven't changed anything with my canvas panel. And I've just added a bunch of text objects. Okay, these are all text. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit for you. Obviously your spacing, your font, your style, that's all up to you. But the important things I have here are I have a title and then a value associated for everything that I'm going to display. Again, in today's episode, we're only covering damage and stun frames. However, startup frames, active frames, recovery frames of each move we do and each animation we have are going to be relevant in the next episode of Frame Data. And again, we'll probably do advantages and things as well. So if you'd like, go ahead and set up a bunch of stats here and you know, keep track of whatever you want to keep track of. For all of the titles, it is literally just a text object that I brought onto the screen. And then you can see what I've done here. I don't have the titles as variables because we won't need to change them in the middle of the game. So I just name them whatever, like damage title. I put it at the proper position that I want. I click size the content so the text box goes around the size of the actual text. And then nothing else for here, other than I actually changed the appearance of it. So you can see that I picked my font, changed my size, my outline size, all that good stuff. Once I made one, I actually copied it five times and just changed the name. So uh, damage title goes to stun frames title, and then I changed the actual text to stun frames. And the rest is exactly the same. So you can do that for all of your startup, active, and recovery, or whatever else you may have as well. 
Once you have all your titles on here, and they're all named differently so that you know what they are, we also are going to need a value to store. Okay, so we're going to need the actual value of the damage that was done, the actual number of stun frames that were applied. And then again, startup, active, and recovery aren't in use, but we will need an actual value we can change, not just a text, a random hard-coded text value like we have here. Okay, so right now, you can put in placeholders like I've done, or you can just set up the ones that we actually have values for today. That is up to you. We'll start with those ones because they're way more important. So you can also add other text variables and we can bind them to proper values, okay? So I called these ones titles and I just called these ones text. Pretty simple. Now for the text, I actually put in a sample value because I wanted to see what it would look like when it was on the screen in the game without playing the game every single time. So instead of putting in like damage here, I just put in a value. We could do 15 damage. So I put in 15. Again, choose your positions, line it up. Appearance is exactly the same, but if you want to take a look, here's what I've got. Okay. And we're going to bind them in a second. So set up all your text variables as well for all the results. All right, stun frames, and again, startup active recovery. All right, and these are our default values. Again, these won't change, but these could. So it's up to you what you want to put in there. But as long as you have these in here so that we can see them when we add it to the HUD, you will be good. It's obviously not required that you have any specific values in here because they're going to change as attacks are used and all that good stuff. Now we do have to do some stuff in the event graph. So when you're ready, open up the graph and let's go to the actual event graph first. I'll show you the bindings in a second. And we're going to need our game mode BP. So we need to know if this widget is for player one or for player two. And that's a little bit more cut and dry right now because we don't have side selection. When we get side selection, both the frame data widget we're making now and the press any input to join widgets we made in previous episodes, they will need to be able to adjust based on who, you know, what player, if it's player two is actually on the left when they start, we have side selection. We need to make sure we adjust that widget accordingly. And that goes for a lot of things on our actual widget here. Like the mutant here is always actually bound to player one and the health bar is bound to player one's health. These are all things we'll cover. So don't stress too much. Just know that we do need to know which widget or which player this widget is going to be assigned to because each player is going to have their own frame data. And so we want to track both and we want to display the data at the correct side. So even without side selection, we still want to set some stuff up for this. So once we're in the event graph, we're going to need, like I said, our game mode, and we're going to need a Boolean. We can start with the Boolean if you'd like. Just go ahead and add a variable here. I call it is widget for P1. Once you compile and save after making this widget, then you can click instance editable and expose on spawn. This will allow you to see this variable when it is placed inside of other widgets, such as our HUD. I'll go over this again when we get to the HUD, but you can see that I have a section here, is widget for P1. And uh, instance editable allows us to change that, not just see it, but also change it. So we can change it on each instance, meaning that is widget for P1 is true on the left side, is widget for P1 is false on the right side. So you don't have to do anything with this variable in the graphs at all. You will in the binding, but not in actually setting it. We're just going to grab the value. It's only going to be set in the HUD. So don't worry about that. Just make it for now. Make sure it's instance editable and expose on spawn. Then in event construct, you'll already have this. It'll be kind of grayed out or a little bit transparent when you start the, when you first enter the graph. But what I do typically is just delete everything in there and then make a new one. So event construct, you'll get this node here. Then what we want to do is grab the game mode because the game mode is responsible for keeping track of the players right now. So we type get game mode. 
but then we drag off the return value and cast it to the game mode that we're using, which for me is default game mode BP. And then lastly, I had brought off of this pin and clicked promote to variable to get a game mode reference. You can call it whatever you want, but this is going to be how we can access the game mode. You've probably seen that a lot in the series, so no big deal. So now we'll have these two variables and we're good for the event graph. Now we have to bind each of the values in this widget to the appropriate numbers. All right, so now going back to the binding, if we're on the designer, you can click on the text you want to bind. In this case, it is the damage and the stun frames text. So we're going to start with the damage. Now in the details panel right here under content, you'll have text and that's where we set the 15. That's the default value. Well, you'll also have this little plus bind here and I'll show you one that I haven't bound yet. It'll see, it'll say bind with a little down arrow. You can click it and then hit create binding. I'm not going to do this because I've already created one, but once you do, it will bring you straight to the binding. It'll bring you to the graph and to the binding. So it would bring you here and it would probably be called the, it'll be get the name of this underscore text zero or something similar. For me, that name's a little ugly. So I went ahead and right clicked on it and renamed it and I just called it what it was. So get damage text. I think that's more appropriate. And now we're going to have to do some stuff in here that's going to require us to add some variables and set them in some other places. So we're going to halt here for a second and we're going to go to the code instead. But now we have our binding so we know that we're ready to get the appropriate value on this widget. Let's go into our code and we'll start up at the top. We're, we're going to do everything in fighter template character because each character, again, will have their own frame data. And right now we're only worried about damage and stun frames. Both of those things are tracked already by the character. So we just have to make it a little bit easier to grab these values and keep them consistent. So let's scroll down to where we make our variables. And I have a new float and a new integer today that we are adding. So here we go. I've added two variables today. So I have last damage received, which is a float. And then I have integer last stun frames received. Damage is still considered a float in our game because progress bars are a ratio of zero to one. So I've been using float values. And so we can still use a float value. And so I'm going to do just that. We do want it to be U property, edit anywhere, blueprint, read, write. I gave it a category of frame data, but we need to be able to access it in the blueprint. So we do need it to be at least a U property. And same with the stun frames, we're going to need it to be a U property because we're going to access both of these in the binding. So we need to be able to get them in the blueprints. But the reason we're making new variables is because we want to keep track of the last damage we received as the player. And the last stun frames that we received as the player. After we've made our variables, we can go ahead and set them to the appropriate values. Now, if we go to the fighter template character.cpp, we have our constructor where we set all of our default values. We should reset them to zero anytime new characters respond like this, or we should set them to zero flat out when the game starts, like we're doing here. So, last damage received equals 0.0f because it's a float, and last stun frames received equals zero because it is an integer. We want them both to start at zero because even though we have these default values in the frame data panel, just for testing, we don't want them to actually display as these values when we enter the the frame data panel, but they should be zero if they're bound. The startup active and recovery right now are not going to be bound. So of course they will actually display five, two and four, but again, they're not in use. So not a big deal. Now this is good that we set them to a default, but we need to figure out where we actually want to set them. And the most logical spot is the take damage function because take damage is where we set the damage amount and actually reduce the player's health by that value. And we also set hit stun frames and block stun frames in this function. So starting off, when we get into take damage, we have a few if checks here to make sure we're not in a super and if we're not defeated from the hit, 
Then we get into making sure that the character has not blocked. If no block was performed, they're taking the full damage that this hitbox has passed along to take damage. All right. Well, that's the damage we want to use for last damage received. You could do last damage received equals damage amount and be done with it, but this will give you a decimal, whereas I know a lot of the times these values are displayed as integers. So even though it doesn't matter logically what the value is, you can make it work either way as long as you're consistent. For display purposes, you may want it to be an, an integer or appear as an integer, even if it is a float behind the scenes. You might want it to be a value greater than zero. So if we did 45 damage, instead of being 0 0.5, it would say 45. If you want this effect and you are using a float for your damage like I am, you'll have to multiply damage amount by 100 and set that equal to your damage received. All right, now let's scroll down a little bit. We also have this section where we set num stun frames to the hit stun frames that pass in because remember, this is an unsuccessful block. So this character was not able to block, so they're taking the hit stun frames, not the block stun frames. At this point, we want to track the stun frames that we received and set it equal to none stun frames. We don't have any conversions for this because hit stun frames is accurate. You could also just take last stun frames received and set it equal to hit stun frames directly. It doesn't matter. The only reason this is a separate variable since they seem to equal the same thing is because num stun frames actually decreases with every tick. And so if it's being decremented and we're losing stun frames, then the frames that would show up on the widget would also change. We actually don't want to do that in this case, at least in this example. If you want that, that's fine. But a lot of times the stun frames will remain static. So if the attack did 40 stun frames, which is super high, but again, we're working with uh, slower animations right now in this tutorial series. So say the attack did 40 stun frames. Well, I don't want it to say 39, 38, 37. I want it to stay at 40 so I can see how many stun frames I was granted from performing that attack and landing it. So we have this separate value that can be tracked and it will just keep track of the last stun frames that the character received, not the current stun frames that they have. Now, if we scroll down a little bit more, this else statement right here is actually the else to say that they have blocked successfully. See, this is the if to check if we blocked. If this is true, we have not blocked. Okay, so we're going to scroll down. Else, that means we have blocked. And that logic is where we set the reduced damage. And right now, I'm just taking a default 0 0.5 and saying we're reducing the damage by half. Great. Now at this point, we will want to take the last damage received and equal to the reduced damage times 100. So we actually want to show the damage that the player took regardless of the state they're in. So if they block and they take zero damage because of it, we should display zero. However, if they block, and in this case, we're just decreasing the damage taken by 0.5, we should display the damage that they've actually taken. So if it was a 10 damage attack and they blocked, we should see five in the frame data because they took five damage for blocking that attack successfully. Same as before, where we set num stun frames to equal to the block stun frames now, since they were able to block the attack successfully, we want to make sure that we set last stun frames received equal to num stun frames, or alternatively, just set it directly to block stun frames as well. Same logic applies here. We don't want the counter of the stun frames to decrease as time goes on. So we have this separate variable here, keeping track of it for both hit stun and block stun. And really for damage and for, for landed damage and block damage as well. It's only two variables, but it keeps track of all the possible scenarios for these. Now, nothing else is added to take damage, so we are good there. At this point, we can compile, play, open up the editor again, and go back to our widget. We should already have our one binding. So now we have everything that we need to start our start making our bindings. I'm going to do get damage text first. 
I'm going to use my game mode reference as a starting point here. I'm going to get it and I'm going to right click and convert it to a validated get because we only want to do this action if it is valid. So only if it's valid, do I want to check and see if is widget for P1 is true or false, because depending on what who the widget is for, it depends on where we grab the data from. All right, so you just grab is widget for P1 and pull out into a branch. Super simple there as well. Now off the game mode reference, we have player one and player two. When we get into tag matches, this will change slightly, but we still will have these references to each character. And so this will still work. We'll just have to update it to work for each character and not just player one, player two. So we drag off our game mode reference and we grab the data that we want. So we want to grab player one and player two in this case. All right, that's what I got right here. Now you could use validated gets here if you wanted to make sure they were valid, but in practice mode, I'm pretty much assuming there's always going to be at least two players. So it's fairly safe by all means, check if it's valid before using it. If you have other plans. Now these players are fighter template characters that we set up many, many episodes ago. So you can drag off of them and we will be able to grab those variables that we set up and made visible in the blueprint. So they were called last damage received and we want to get them. So since this is the damage binding, we're getting it on each of the players here. Last damage received. And the binding will have a return node in here by default. You probably won't have anything plugged into it at the start. We can plug in, we have to plug in a text value, but any of our values like floats, integers, they can be converted to text. Unreal has a two text function, so we don't have to really do anything. Just drag the float into the return value and it will add this node for you. Then you can clean it up as I have and made it a little bit nicer looking as opposed to directly on top of each other. But also you can, you only have one return node when you start, you can copy it and paste another one to get another return node in here, or you can right click and just type return node and add return node. If widget is for player one, then player one last damage received should be what we return. If widget is for player two, meaning that we hit the false branch, then we want to grab player two's last damage received and return that. Great. So now our damage text should work. We still don't have it on our HUD yet, so you won't be able to actually see it. But as long as you have it set up like this, it should be fine. We can always debug later when we put it on. Let's go and make the stun frames binding. So just a refresher, you're going to click on your stun frames text, you're going to go to content text, and then add binding. When you do that, it's going to bring you directly into the graph under get stun frames text, rename it if you want. And this is essentially going to be the exact same thing. So you can copy everything from get damage text if you want and paste it in here we will have to change a few things of course but it's close enough that it won't really hurt you to do that but essentially we're grabbing our game mode reference only if it's valid do we want to continue we want to check if the widget is for player one or player two so we know whose stun frames to grab we're going to grab player one and player two from our game mode reference and then instead of getting damage we're going to grab last stun frames received for both player one and player two. We need two return nodes. And like before, you can just drag an integer into a return node and it will convert it for you. So we want both of these. If it is for player one, we want to return player one's last stun frames. If it is for player two, we want to return player two's last stun frames. At this point, you will have your damage and your stun frames and their bindings set up properly. And so now we need to just display it and make sure that it is working and bound as expected. To do that, we can add it to the HUD. So if you open up your base game mode HUD, there's a few things I'd recommend doing to make our lives a little bit easier. We have these press any input to join widgets if you've been following the series and they keep track of the type of controller we have and display saying press any input on this controller 
and you will join the game. Well, they're great widgets and we're going to use them more in the future, but they're kind of in the way right now of where we are. And also you most likely don't even want to see these in practice mode. So I'm going to just hide them period for now, but we can just make them visible again and we will in the next controller episode. So don't stress. I clicked on each of these widgets here, but you can do it one at a time. Doesn't matter. Just go to your press P1, press any key to join P2, press any key to join. And you can set their visibility to hidden that way they're not showing up in the game you can also click the little eyeball on the widget itself to just hide them from the view because they happen to be where i want to put my frame data panels so right now they're kind of in the way as you saw but i can just hide them so that i can't see them they're not gone i haven't deleted them we don't have to remake them you just click the little eyeball and they'll come back cool so now that we have a little bit more space to work with, we can add our frame data panel. Now to do that, you can search for a widget like any other widget, just how we added those press any key to join widgets actually, same method. So we're gonna search for, for whatever it is that they're called. So I'm gonna search for frame data panel and you can see it came up right away, but you can find your widget and you can just literally drag it onto the screen. I already have two, so I'm gonna delete this new one I made, but I had done it twice. And I call them different things. I called the one on the left P1 frame data panel, the one on the right P2 frame data panel. All right, now for these, you can set your positions, but the important part is that you set this variable appropriately. Remember I said that this widget or that this assignment would be set up here on the HUD widget. So now we wanna make sure is widget for P1 is true for the one on the left and false for the one on the right. Once you do that, that data will be properly correlated to player one and player two. I am going to scroll down to the visibility and actually hide these widgets by default as well. That's why you couldn't see them when I was in versus mode because we're manually going to enable these for practice mode. So both of these are set to hidden by default. That way they do not show up in your other modes. One other thing, make sure you have these as variables. I believe widgets are variables by default, but just make sure you go to each of these and click the box next to the, the name that says is variable and make sure it is checked. If it's checked already, you're good. You don't have to click it. Just make sure that it does look like mine because we're actually gonna grab it in the graph and use it for certain things. Now, them being here is enough. You could set them to be visible right away and see if they work or not. That's up to you. But I'm going to go into the graph and actually make them visible on event construct. So in event construct of the base game mode HUD before, we had this logic right here, where we got the game mode, set a reference to the game mode, grab the number of rounds, and determine the number of round circles to display. I put a bunch of stuff before this now because I felt like the game instance should fire off before the game mode, and that's why I did it this way. But basically, we're going to get our game instance, grab the game mode type, and only if it's a type that would display this frame data do we want to make it visible. Otherwise, it's going to stay hidden. So you can just select all this and move it over. And then we're going to do get game instance. We're going to cast it to the game instance we use in our project, which is base game instance for me. I'm gonna promote that to a variable so that I get the game instance reference. I already have one, so I'm gonna skip that part, but that's how you get these three nodes. Since this is a type of base game instance, we have an enum in that class called game mode type. And game mode type keeps track of what type of game we're in. So if we're in story mode, it's different from versus and practice, and we can choose what displays and what doesn't based off that enum. In this case, we wanna check our game mode type enum and we're gonna get it. If you drag off an enum, you can do a switch statement on it and it will return all the values possible. So that's how we get these two nodes. Now at this point, the only one I ever wanna display frame data in is practice or training, whatever you wanna call it. So I actually have a reroute node and I have versus, story, arcade, and online all going to the reroute node up top, which just goes into this next reroute node, which goes into the initial logic we had for the event construct. 
If it is, however, practice and training, then I have a different reroute node that we go to, and we do two extra nodes here. We grab each of the frame data panels, so you can just find them in the list and grab them, or you can type them in. But P1 frame data panel, and P2 frame data panel, get them both. Just call it set visibility. Now you can leave it as visible, or I made it not hit testable, self only. Not hit testable just means you can't click on it. There are a few other things that it relates to, but really that's the main thing. Now, we don't have a lot of mouse control in our in-game menus or in our, our in-game logic. We only have it for our actual menus. But I figured I'd just make it not hit testable because I don't want to be able to click on it right now anyway. So what <laughs> difference does it make? No reason to allow it for it to, to block if we ever did want to click on the screen. Or like, for example, if we had the pause menu up, instead of worrying about Z order, we just don't have to worry about this at all as we'll never have a collision on it. That's just a small list of reasons why I made it this, but you can make it whatever you want. Just make sure that you can see it. You don't want it to be collapsed or hidden. It can be visible, not hit testable self and all children, or not hit testable self only. Once you've done this for both frame data panels, just bring it back into that reroute node, and we still want to do the rest of the event construct logic. With all that done, you'll be able to play your game, enter practice mode, select your stage, all that good stuff, we'll randomize it. And we will be able to see our frame data panels for both players right here. And as the players take damage and get stun frames, they should update. You can see player two hits player one and the same thing happens. It also works for projectiles and all that because we're not putting in any weird spot. It's just anytime damage occurs, we're gonna set that. See, so, so four stun frames, 25 damage. 15 damage, six stun frames. 10 damage, eight stun frames, and so on and so forth. So there you go, guys. That's how you can get your initial frame data logic up and running. We have the widget. We have it only populating in practice mode. And we have our damage and stun frames being tracked successfully. In the next frame data episode, we will go over startup, active, recovery, and advantages, disadvantages, that sort of data for our frame data in practice mode. But I hope you enjoyed this episode. And if you did, please subscribe. It does more for myself and the channel than anything else you can do. I just really appreciate it. I want to give another shout out to my YouTube membership and Patreon supporters and subscribers. Thank you guys for all the love and support for keeping me going. 150 episodes strong. Thank you guys for everything. I'm glad everyone is enjoying this series as much as I am. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. There's a link in the description. You can click it, join. It's completely free. I'd be happy to help you. Anyway, guys, like I said, that's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.